Hello and welcome to the Dell Community Resource. Welcome to our 11th webinar of Tuesdays at 2, our 11th and final webinar that we've brought to you. We've been with you for these last uh, 11 weeks during the state of emergency in the province of Ontario. This is a great opportunity for Steve Menor and I to express our gratitude, our thanks for the support of our faculty who continue to be working behind the scenes from week to week, as well as our staff who've been instrumental in be us being able to deliver this content to you over these past three months. Final topic for the Tuesdays at two is going to be focusing on a new beginning. What does patient care look like in the COVID-19 era? Understanding that we are emerging into practice at a time when there's still virus obviously in our communities and which will continue to be there for the foreseeable future. Just as we've always done for these last 11 weeks to take a look around us, to lift our head up and see what's going on and to be reminded that when we started, when we were uh, asked to close our offices on March 15th, the number of cases were very minimal at the time. And if we look at the uh, incidence of COVID-19 in the community, it's remained fairly consistent for these last several weeks. Manor, would you like to comment on this graph? Yes, thank you, John. Hello, everyone. Um, what's interesting is when you look at this at this graph, you realize that we're pretty much where we were uh, about two months ago, which seems like another, you know, like an eternity ago. And it makes you sort of wonder why now are the doors starting to feel like they're opening up when the numbers are not that different than before? And, you know, it's a conversation maybe beyond me, but um, is it is it us being tired of what's going on? Is it politics? Is it economics? Uh, any or all of those things, um, but please keep in mind the fact that the numbers haven't changed that much in the last couple of months as we as we continue to talk uh, for the next little while um, with the guidelines. I think it's an important reminder, right, that as we uh, return to clinical practice, this graph, as it continues to be made available to us on a daily basis, is going to give us a good sense of, of the incidence of disease in our respective communities. So where did we leave off? Uh, it's safe to say that this has been a pretty amazing week as far as news on a global, national, international level. But in our dental bubble, there's also been a lot that has gone on. We left off with you last week uh, with three different scenarios, three different camps that were forming amongst the dental community. There were those who, based on the guidelines uh, that were made available to us on Friday the 22nd of May, were prepared to do nothing because of the demands that were specified in that document and had elected to wait. There were others who were uh, adamant about wanting to mobilize and protest, and others uh, who were told uh, to get ready and proceeded to do so. And if we look back at the events of this past week, uh, we have, I'm sure, examples uh, amongst our community of friends and colleagues, including ourselves, who did some of the, of the above uh, to varying degrees. Things changed on Tuesday, which was our 10th uh, Tuesday at two. That evening, we all received an email from the Royal College, um, basically encouraging us to sit tight for a moment. A new directive was released by the chief medical officer uh, that amended the second directive that had initially been released uh, back on March 19th. It was this document that essentially set into motion a whole series of events that transpired in these last seven days. This new directive as amended became available last Tuesday and was uh, also accompanied by new operational requirements for the health sector as dictated and, de and uh, defined by the Ministry of Health in our province. Steve, did you want to comment on this? Hello, everybody. Um, this document was written um, by the Ministry of, of Health, and I started to uh, really start to understand the politics and the, and the order of all this. The Minister of Health is the one who decides the fate of all the healthcare professions in the province. And the colleges, all the independent colleges, and I think John will speak to the, the colleges that are under this jurisdiction, really have to report to the Ministry of Health. And dentistry is just one of them. 
And in this document that was released last Tuesday, um, they really set, set out the, the order for us to return to work, to return to normal practice. And when I say normal practice, I mean start to be able to expand the patients that we were able to see. And when we really understood this document, you understood that the college document that we were waiting for that arrived uh, on Sunday night is, the, is really just the, the dental version of this document. And there really was no surprises. And I think if we really take a step back and, and we hear all the colleges, all the, uh, the, the healthcare colleges that are under this jurisdiction will all have a very similar document to work with. So I think that it's important to really take a look at the Ministry of Health when we're trying to figure out where we are. It was the Minister of Health that decided that we could only see emergency patients back in March 19th, I believe the date was, when he released or the, the, she released the, uh, the guidelines that, that actually stopped all of the uh, health colleges um, from, from practicing beyond just emergency care at that time. And it is now the same minister that is saying it's time to not hold back health care from people in the province of Ontario. So understanding that, we're really starting to, to appreciate where this is coming from and that the regulations are really a reflection of where the Minister of Health and the Chief uh, Medical Officer really want to see us. So I, I think it's important that we understand that. I think it's also worth mentioning that the unfortunate uh, thing that occurred this past week was just the timing of, of, of the way information was released. The uh, May 22nd document that we received with the updated guidelines that identified and defined essential care were released to us on Friday the 22nd, although initially they were supposed to be released on Monday the 25th. And then the day after, the very next day, um, this, uh, these two documents came out from the Ministry of Health. In the span of 72 hours, a lot of us in the Dell community had gone out. Uh, Minori, I recall you just uh, a week ago talking about your visceral reaction to that document on that Friday and, and what it elicited in you to go out and start looking of things that you were going to uh, incorporate in your office to meet the requirements for different engineering controls, uh, etc. And this has happened to a lot of people, and understandably, for a lot of a uh, lot of dentists and a lot of members of the dental community, um, that went went pretty far in terms of purchasing of, of hardware, PPE, engineering controls, those sorts of things, and then we're asked to basically put the brakes on on Tuesday night. When we received that information. The week continued uh, and we were waiting um, for these new guidelines so those people hadn't, had, hadn't made any changes to their office, those who decided to sit and wait, waited all week and we were hoping that by Friday we'd have some guidance and we were just told that the college needed a few more days and sure enough on Sunday afternoon the amended guidance was indeed provided. Um, Stephen Menor, uh, starting with you, Steve, would you like to comment a little bit about your initial response to the document itself? You know, when the document arrived on Sunday afternoon, I, I felt like a kid tearing through a gift at Christmas time, ripping open the package and, and heading right down to what was, was I going to need N95s for my entire staff? Was I going to need all kinds of engineering and and airflow changes, was I need to you know, need doors on all the operatories? And that was my entire focus. I, I ripped through the document, I scanned the upper portion of the document, I found the PPE and engineering part. And I, I have to admit only when I, I, and when my first reaction was one of relief uh, and, and I was somewhat um, very relieved to see that, that that they had followed the minister uh, and, and the guidelines that, that she had given out with regard to PPE, with regard to aerosols. Um, and, and it was a much more reasonable and manageable document. And I felt relieved from our entire profession. I was, I was really, you know, I had spoken to so many colleagues that were really anguished with, with the, the, from a week ago Friday, what we had received and how this was going to adversely affect them. And I felt relieved for a lot of people. So my, my feeling here was one of relief. But I also recognized after a few minutes and I went back and, I, and my staff started to call and, and my associates started to call and I really wanted to understand the document before I commented. 
that I had missed a lot of what's in it. And I think, John, as we go through this presentation, I think that I lost a little bit of the forest through the trees here. I, I got very focused on getting back to work, seeing the words that I needed to see, that we could, we could do uh, an increased amount of care. We could essentially treat all of the patients if we had chosen to, and that we did, wouldn't need such severe restrictions to do so. So I was relieved. I was somewhat starting to feel like there's light at the end of the tunnel. I was not quite giddy, but I was getting there. Um, and now I, I've had a more sobering time to look at this, and I'll we'll reflect in a few minutes. Menor, your reaction? Yeah. So when I when I saw this, this was the, the the guideline that I was hoping for about a week and a half ago, um, when my visceral reaction was, oh, still we're we're still in the thick of things. The N95, the PPE, even though when we talk about that pyramid, that PPE is actually the least important thing. But I still feel it's the one thing that's kept so many offices, so many practitioners from being able to practice. Uh, just getting those N95s. So seeing this was what I was hoping to see uh, about 10 days earlier. And I skimmed through everything and I realized a lot of things haven't changed except for just those few things. Maybe the air settling time, the 15 minutes, the uh, as we'll elaborate on, and the, the, the N95s. So there's some relief that, okay, now more realistically, more, more colleagues can open up. Yeah, and, and personally, I'd expressed to you a week ago my concern about the practicality of being able to practice with an N95 and a mask on top of that, a magnification loops and a face shield and, and the daunting sort of task of being able to go through a day of, of experiencing that was, was enormously relief. So my feeling too was one of relief in, in reading this document. And I too fast forwarded to page 10 to, to identify and to try to understand what was being asked us. As is one of this group of the DCR, of Steve Menor and I, we're gonna spend the next little uh, while together here, breaking this down, unpacking it for you, just to make sure that all of us have read this uh, through the same lens and that nothing has been indeed missed. So, there's been some new guidance and as we typically do, we're just going to focus on the new parts to this document just in comparison to the, um, the May 22nd document we had received. So this guidance stems, as we said just a minute, couple of minutes ago, uh, stems from the Chief Medical Officer of Health Directive Number 2, which was released after being amended on, on Tuesday last week. Now, finally, after almost three months, dentists in Ontario are currently permitted to provide in-person care for all deferred non-essential and elective services, in addition to what we were allowed to do before, which was emergency and urgent care. We're also told in this document, that's why I think it's really important to, to, to review the Ministry of Health document, that if we're going to provide in-person in care, we must review the guidance from that Ministry of Health document I shared with you a few minutes ago, which is this one right here and readily available to you and on our website. The new guidance, uh, has four main categories, which we're going to walk you through uh, right at this time. Starts off with the needs we have for those of us who are practice owners to prepare our office, zeroing in on general staff requirements, reminding us to try to minimize the number of people gathering at the same time, how to set up our offices, and a review of, a, of our personal PPE. When it comes to PPE, this is not new, but just a reminder that we should use PPE appropriately, understanding the tremendous challenges that all of us have faced in the last few weeks of, uh, of supply chain for PPE and how many of us have struggled in being told that, you know, N95s, for example, would only be available in a month's time, in two months' time, et cetera. And that these N95 respirators or their equivalent should indeed be reserved for situations where risk are highest. And I think it's incumbent on us in making sure that we have that conversation of risk. When it comes to the specific provisions of dental care, there's some new elements to this document which we have not seen before. Again, a reminder of what we're allowed to do now, which is deferred non-essential and elective services in addition to emergency and urgent care. But very importantly, uh, and I think we need to pause here for a moment, we must also exercise professional judgment when deciding how to triage and how to manage patient care. This includes deciding which patients to triage and manage remotely, and once again, really strongly encouraged to get involved with teledentistry, which patients we should treat in person, 
and which appointments we should indeed defer until the risk posed by COVID-19 are further mitigated. Because let's, let's be very clear here, we're still emerging into care at a time when there's a pandemic going on and COVID-19 is still a major concern for all of us. Another a very important point, which is also new and important for us to draw to your attention, are that the decisions we make have to be made with careful consideration of these following principles. Once again, identified, spelled out very clearly for us in this document. So number one, the reminder for us to, the need for us to maintain physical distancing as a general risk mitigation tactic. Once again, that elimination of the upside down triangle, the possible use of technology to provide guidance and care to patients using dentistry, the imperative to reduce risks to patients. This includes weighing the risk of not receiving treatment or indeed deferring treatment against the risk of them coming to our office. We've heard of many people, particularly of a certain uh, age group, those over 70, who have not stepped out of their homes in three months. And lastly, the imperative to defer in-person care for patients who have screened or tested positive for COVID-19 whenever possible. A very important reminder to us too. So in light of this foundation, this updated guidance for a lot of members, many members of our community, was interpreted in different ways. Last week, I think we left off collectively with a, an understanding and appreciation that the light had turned from a hard red, which suggested no movement, to an amber light. Having read the guidance up until this point, several colleagues have reached out to us and, and interpret this as being a green light. Not only a green light, but essentially racing back to care uh, on Monday at a full speed ahead. Um, and others who tend to be possibly more cautious maybe saw this guidance as a blinking red light. Steve, what were your thoughts? Initially, I went back and I have to tell you, initially I was very relieved and I thought, okay, we can, we can work with this. And then I went back and I read the Ministry of Health document, the one that was the precursor for the RCDSO document that arrived on, on Friday, and went back and, and, as you just did, looked at some of the, the wording and the ideas that this is, an we are, are now essentially not having to just treat emergency care. I think my understanding of this is a little bit different. The Minister of Health has now decided that where we are now with um, community transfer in the of the virus, it is a, no longer appropriate to keep Ontario uh, Ontarians away from healthcare, and and they need to have access to healthcare. And they created these documents, the two of them, and I strongly urge you all to read them and really spend time reading them. They created these documents to do that in a safe way, with the understanding and the backdrop of a pandemic that has not gone away. And the number of times that we are cautioned to do this slowly and methodically and advise more than just advise, directed that we can see all types of care, whether they are non-essential, elective or deferred. We no longer have to limit the patients, but we must choose when that care is deemed in the best interest with the overall backdrop of a pandemic. And you have to start using your professional judgment on which patients would be appropriate to see at this time based on the need, the risks and the benefits. An 80 year old who might need a, a hygiene appointment, not to diminish the need of a hygiene appointment, but you have to weigh the risks of an 80 year old coming to your office versus the benefit of that dental treatment would be difficult to justify if you go back and read that document. And I know Menor, uh, we sort of have a different opinion on this, but when I go and look at this, this document in light of all the documents that are surrounding it and where we are with community transmission, as you pointed out earlier today, I see this as a flashing red light. I don't see this by any means as a green light. I see this that we can proceed, but only with extreme caution, checking on both sides, checking the amount of, of community transmission that's happening around us and being prepared that if the traffic is too much the other direction, we're going to have to sit there for a while. So my read of this after, and I have to be honest with you, I'm not so clever. I had to read it several times before I really understood what this meant to me, is that yes, we can operate. Yes, we can open. 
and we should start to think of, of protecting our livelihoods and returning financially to a position that we can that is viable but we need to do it with extreme caution and we're instructed to do it with extreme caution if you're like me and ripped open the document and got to page 10 and found it out uh, found out if i needed air filters or not that was missing all the other precursors to this that really set the stage for a slow and deliberate opening that we're mandated to do. So I caution you all, I'm not gonna ever advise anybody what to do or not to do, that's not our mandate, but to go back and really try to read and understand the document. Uh, Menor? Yeah, no, so, you know, Steve, you're, you're preaching to the choir. Someone uh, like myself has been practicing now um, for the last several weeks with all the PP and all the gear and, and the ex exceptional precautions, um, to all of a sudden say, no, I can drop all this stuff. I don't need to follow all of these guidelines, the PPE, and I don't need to dress up like an astronaut. Even though just a few days earlier, things were so different and yet the numbers are no different really uh, for the last little while is, is sort of surreal. So, you know, I know we're, we're on the same page. For you, it's a flashing amber light. For me, if it, if it is a green one, holy cow, it's an early green one with a lot of speed bumps, with, with you know, speed limits. Uh, my concern was on Sunday night where I started to get a lot of friends texting me. Um, I actually heard about this through friends immediately who texted me saying, that's it, we're back in business. Literally, that was the, the, the motto. And I said, hang on a second. If we're back in business, we better be very cautious because don't forget that virus might be around us still. We are still in a pandemic and really have things changed that much within just a few days. Um, so we're on the same page. Uh, if it is a green one, it's an exceptionally cautious one. Um, it's not back in business like we were three months ago. No way. Uh, and for someone like me who's been on uh, out there, um, it's it's instinctive for me to still be so cautious and careful about things. Yeah, it's it's truly remarkable the response that we've heard from members of the DCR who sort of are almost incredulous that the the requirements changed, appear to change so dramatically, literally from one week to the next. So let's continue to unpack this. We focus in on the, the details that relate to providing dental care. There's lots of information given to us about scheduling appointments, patient arrival protocols, what to do during dental care, how to manage patients as they depart and end of day sanitation. What we found in this document is that everything now moving forward is going to hinge on the health questionnaire, the patient screening guidance document that the Ministry of Health uh, published on May 17th. And it's the result of this, of this uh, completion of this document that's going to categorize patient as being COVID uh, screening positive or COVID screening negative. Let me explain. These are the questions. Uh, there are four questions. The first question that I didn't include is for long-term uh, uh, long care facilities. And the questions are as follows. Number one, did the person have close contact with anyone with acute respiratory illness or traveled outside of Ontario in the past 14 days? Number two, does the person have a confirmed case of COVID-19 or had close contact with a confirmed case of COVID-19? Number three, does the person have any of the following symptoms, yes or no? And there's a whole list of them, which you can uh, follow up on. And the last question is specific to the vulnerable cohort, as we know, those over the age of 70 and asking them if they are experiencing any of the following symptoms, such as delirium, unexplained or increased number of falls, acute functional decline, or worsening of chronic condition. So this is now going to be the instrument that we're going to use to determine whether somebody COVID screens negative, if they answer no to all of the questions, or whether they're COVID screen positive, if they answer yes to any of the screening questions. And if you're gonna be conducting these questionnaires yourself, it's really imperative to understand them, or particularly if you're a member of your team is going to make sure that they're comfortable uh, going through this with all the patients that you see in advance of coming to your office and then again once they visit your offices. So this is the distinction that's being made. Now, when it comes to non-aerosol generating procedures and the required PPE, if they screen negative, we will treat them the way we've always treated them with a level two or three mask, gloves, an eye protection or a face shield. For non-aerosol generating procedures, if they screen positive, we will treat them with level two or three procedure masks, gloves, eye protection or face shield, and the protective gown. What's really different, which is where I think we all race to page 10, 
was for aerosol generating, generating procedures because of the concerns we had with the logistics of wearing an N95, the supply chain issues with an N95. We were told that if patients screen negative, these are the patients who we should be treating, then we can manage them for aerosol generating procedures with an N95, or we have the choice to use a level two or three procedure mask, gloves, eye protection, or face shield, and suddenly a protective gown is optional. It's not mandatory. This is in contrast to those patients who screen positive to COVID-19, where we must use an N95, gloves, eye protection, a face shield, and a protective gown. If, if, uh, pardon sorry. me, that, that previous slide, what's important to note is if they are screened positive to any one of those questions on that list, it highlights the importance of pre-screening them before they come into the office. Because the last thing you want to do, and let's be honest, we're all wet-fingered uh, clinicians here with practices to run. You don't want to bring in a patient, book a whole appointment, uh, especially nowadays when they're so precious, and all of a sudden realize that, well, maybe they're, they're screening positive. You need to now have N95s and you don't have the N95. And that whole appointment was for nothing. Not to mention, you just brought in a patient and another individual into your practice. It, it really highlights the importance of pre-screening them carefully, um, as we should now, and uh, beforehand and also as they arrive in the office. And, and Menor, if you do if you do go through this document, there is actually a requirement for phone screening prior to, and then once again at the location screening. So that is in the document as well. And, and you're right. Besides being good advice, it's also the guideline. Right. That's right. And this is like you're saying. There's so much more to take away from this uh, guideline than just jumping on like like so many of us just to see. Okay, what about the aerosol time? What about the N95? Um, yeah, read it, read it many times, like you said, Steve, and read it carefully. But think about the logistics of what this means also to your day-to-day -day, uh, practice um, moving forward. Yeah, the screening is without a doubt the gatekeeper to, to the care we're going to provide. So that is not something that can be overlooked. Uh, it has to be done properly. It has to be done appropriately, both on the phone and when the patients present at, your, at our offices. The other thing I think that's really important to note during dental care for aerosol generating procedures for those who screen negative, that now suddenly that follow time has been defined to just being 15 minutes, one five, 15 minutes after completion of the clinical care and exit of each patient. So if, once again, just to, to recap, if we are providing an aerosol generating procedure for a patient who screened negative for COVID-19, the waiting time is only 15 minutes and that's it. No other uh, additional things need to be considered. And I'd like to make that the um, wait time is not tied at all to air exchange, to air purification. The wait time has been decided at 15 minutes for all uh, people who screen negative and there's nothing you can do to shorten it. It is, that is the criteria and I think all of us can kind of live with that. And, and the other part that I'd like to point out um, that it also at the completion of the clinical care and the exit of each patient, it is different than the advice that we were given before, which started the fallow time at the end of the aerosol producing procedure. And I noticed that and I, I wanted to point it out and I can't really explain it other than if we're all gonna read and, and follow the guideline exactly, there was a lot of care written into each word here and I'm assuming there's that is their intention, the exit of each patient. So this doesn't start at the end of the of the aerosol. This starts at the exit of the patient. And I just wanted to point that out. And I don't have an explanation to explain it. And and you know, for uh, for us, we just made a, a decision as we reviewed the document that that will be our protocol. Absolutely. The other thing, for as far as patients departing, it's important for patients to uh, inform us and our staff if they experience any symptoms of COVID-19 within 14 days of their appointment, and you may decide to obviously follow up with them directly uh, to that effect. And, and again, comes again to I'm sorry, if you go back, this is a bit of a change from the earlier documents when we were treating emergency patients where we were supposed to follow up. Now they we are asking them to inform us. So that's a small change for those of you who are reading this really carefully. Terrific. The third point and third category is new to this document, and that's 
we've been provided with guidance for the in-person care of those patients who are indeed COVID-19 positive. Here there are specific instructions on patient arrival protocol for these patients, um, the use of an oral rinse, which I'm going to expand on in a second, the encouragement for us to use, intro, um, to use extra oral radiographs as much as possible, and then obviously the focus on aerosol generating procedures. In this document, we are being told that the use of an oral rinse is limited and required only for patients who have screened or tested positive for COVID-19 and not those who screened negative. So for patients who, who screen or test positive, we're encouraged to, we are asked, I'm sorry, to use a rinse of one to one and a half percent hydrogen peroxide or one percent provodone iodine for 60 seconds prior to the examination. This is a, a new change, an important one to note. Other instructions that we have are how to prepare the operatory, what PPE we're going to require, which I've already touched upon, mitigating high-risk aerosols using high-volume suction and rubber dam when possible, specific cleaning and disinfection protocols following these uh, aerosol generating procedures, and then obviously the discussion when, since we're dealing with COVID-19 positive screen patients on fallow time. And we, once again, are directed so the time required for removal or settling of aerosols by air changes per hour. And this is the same table that was introduced to us in the May 22nd document. As far as the last item, the fourth category, which is COVID-19 exposure in the practice, there are two new items worth bringing to your attention. Yes. I, I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah, please. But, but I, I just don't want any confusion. When you go back one slide, this whole engineering and fallow time document, and I know you've said it, but I just want everybody to be perfectly clear, is now only applicable if you are treating people who screen positive. And I know you've explained it, but I just don't want anybody uh, confused because the document is heavily weighted towards that group in number of pages. And I just want, and I've had a few people tell me, oh, I, you know, I, I saw all that stuff and I didn't realize it was for positive only. So it's very important that we reinforce that this is for the positive screening patient only. Yeah, that's a really good reminder. Thanks, Steve. I think it's, it, you know, so many changes in the period of a week. I think it's, it's very important to remind them. So I appreciate that. As far as the uh, COVID exposure in a practice, like I said, there are two new um, items uh, that were not present before. Number one is that we dentists must ensure that we have a designated space for staff and or patients to self-isolate should they experience symptoms of COVID-19 or suspect possible exposure to COVID-19. This is a new item. And the last one is that in the event that a patient contacts the office to report symptoms of COVID-19 within those 14 days of having been in our offices, it's incumbent on us to contact our local public health unit. So, so please make a note of that moving forward. So, in light of all of this, in light of now having gone through the, the main uh, new items and the new features of this document, I think it's time once again to stop and pause. And maybe that initial uh, sense of optimism we had of being able to move ahead with the green light maybe needs to be reviewed. So I'm going to start off with you, Steve. Um, what are your comments uh, in light of, of what's been presented to us now? I, th I think we are, if we go back to our mandate that we spoke uh, several uh, sessions earlier in, in our Tuesdays at two, that really it was our, our goal to keep, our primary goal when we started to go back to work, to keep ourselves and our patients and our staff safe. And if we remember the pyramid that we introduced six or seven weeks back about, you know, we asked ourselves here at this forum, how do we stay safe? And the best way to stay safe is to limit the number of people that potentially could have this virus entering your office. And that PPE was the last and least important part and fallow times and engineering was the least important part. And this was six, seven, eight weeks ago when we knew very little compared to what we know now. And if we follow how everything went, it sort of followed along that pattern. And I think that we can't lose track and go back and read the guideline again, I'm repeating, but read the guideline again, that the key is still to observe social distancing. We were stopped doing and providing dental care, not because the Minister of Health wanted us not to deliver care, but they wanted to keep people at home. That was why all the healthcare professions were saying, no, you can only do your, your uh, definitely 
emergency people, your urgent care people, but you've got to limit the number of people you bring out of your home. And I think that part of this, where we are with community transmission, hasn't changed all that much. And our obligation is to still, we can open up and we can become economically viable there. They're responding to our screams for, for survival. And I think we have to act in a responsible way and respond to their, uh, the, the people that are managing this pandemic's urge to keep as many people as we can at home, open up our businesses, treat as few people or people that we need to treat without restriction of their condition, people that are waiting for care, but not to have a mammoth amount of people leaving their homes and, and mobilizing, especially large offices like our, where the chances of keeping people safe I feel the burden of keeping my staff and my patients safe. And when I go back and try to do that judiciously, the best way I can do it is to open slowly and methodically and try to balance that with the economics that I need to survive. So when you're looking at, you know, maybe I can push it off to a very, you know, distant yellow light, but it's far from a green light if you go back and really put that this in that context. And I would add to that, that uh, again, we're, as, as I've heard from so many colleagues, oh, we're back to business. That's it, we're back in business as if uh, nothing has happened in the last three months. We're not, we are back in business, but it's a new business. It's a different business. And it is that, that new norm that, that you keep hearing about. It really is. Um, so when I practiced on Monday, after weeks of practicing under the exceptionally strict guidelines, all of a sudden, not wearing gowns and N95s and a face shield, I had to remind my staff, you got to stay vigilant. You still have to be careful because all of a sudden you're wearing the same clothes you pretty much wore three months ago. And that instinct says, well, I guess things are normal now. It's like they're not. They're not still back to normal. We are still in a pandemic. We still have to look after each other and our patients. Uh, I mean, thank goodness now almost everyone can go back to business, but it's not back to normal business. Just please keep that in mind. Thanks, Renora. So as we've, you know, we've used this, uh, this example of, of us getting ready. We were getting ready uh, for something without having guidelines. We were given guidelines. Those guidelines have now been changed. Some would argue quite dramatically. And we have to emerge into patient care with this new beginning, identifying and relying very heavily on our screening of patients so that we have protocols that have seemed to be a lot more uh, attainable and reasonable for those patients who do not screen, COVID, who screen COVID negative. Uh, versus those that screen COVID positive. And I think it's important to make that, that distinction for ourselves and, and for the safety of our, of our patients and our staff. As we discussed with you, yes, please. I could just comment on the, on the race for a moment. I know that there's a lot of frustration in the phone calls that I've had in the last couple of days. Uh, I know there's a lot of frustration for those people who said, you know, we asked for the, for the college to help us identify what's the race. And if you tell us the race, we'll prepare for it. And the race was told to us, and then we started to prepare for it, and then the race changed. And for those people who have started and made changes to their office, uh, with the understanding that that was the only way that they were gonna be able to survive, who went out and bought large shipments of PPE, even though we we tried to, to tell people that we weren't sure and that we should wait till the end. There were people that felt the need to do that and, and went out and did that and put all kinds of different, you know, devices in their office to, I, I also, I, you know, there, there's a lot of anger and a lot of frustration out there. Anger might not be the right word, but frustration. And I think that when I stop and think about it, we always talked about this. And again, going back, you know, maybe eight or nine sessions ago, we talked about, the need for us to serve two masters. One was the regulator and one was the public. And for those of you who made their, their offices appear safer, even though the guidelines, maybe we don't have to satisfy the regulator at that point anymore, we still are going to serve two masters. And the second one being patient perception. And when I think about the doors that I put on my, my operatories where I needed to, um, and the air cleaning units, that will satisfy patient perception and I think, or help to satisfy patient perception. And that is maybe even the bigger challenge. So for those of you 
who made your operatories and now feel that you may have gone overboard, that might still be a very good investment that you made. And I, and I want everybody just to, let's get on with it. Let's get back to work. Let's get this pandemic behind us. Let's start to, to make this an economically viable uh, profession again, like it, it has been for so many of us for so long. So as far as this new beginning uh, that we're all embracing, some have already started to, some are in the process of getting ready for, uh, we feel very strongly it's been a, a consistent message uh, from Steve Menor and I and the rest of our team that our goal is to keep everybody safe, our patients, our team, and of course ourselves and our families. And we spent quite a bit of time dedicating, uh, dedicated to the importance of having long-term economic viability which can really uh, needs to be at the forefront, and then what we need to do in the short term to make sure that we have a, a long range plan. State of emergency continues in the province of Ontario uh, until June 8th. So we are emerging into care, still under that veil. Uh, we're going to be practicing at the time of the COVID-19 pandemic for several more months for sure, with the vaccine being on the horizon, but still in the distance. Safety first is definitely our number one priority. And collectively, the three of us and the rest of our group are going to continue to have a presence, hopefully in your lives uh, professionally, by being available to share best practices. And to this end, we've decided to switch the focus of our focus group conversations. And we'd like to invite you to meet with us for an informal in-person group, once we're allowed to do so, to have discussions to share best practices, because we are all starting from the same time point and reference point now. We will ask you to join us for 30, 40 minutes of your time so that we can discuss your concerns and find how ways how we can support you uh, as you embrace patient care. Please consider joining us by following, signing up the link on the YouTube description of our Tuesdays at two or the link available on our homepage, uh, which, is, which will look like this. We can also rely on updates and news be made available on our website. We subscribe to our YouTube channel. Although the Tuesdays at 2 will come to an end today, there will be opportunities for us to communicate to you through this medium in the future, as well as more traditional ways via email. This is our last webinar, and of course, the determination of any, uh, any endeavor, um, it's bittersweet. On the one hand, we're all pretty excited about the, the possibility to um, start this new adventure, new beginning in our practices. It's a time for me on behalf of our group to express my gratitude to our entire team, Stephen Menor in particular, our staff, our faculty, those who work by this, behind the scenes tirelessly. And also to thank all of you, particularly those of you who gave up some time to join us for our focus group sessions where we hope we were a source of some comfort, an opportunity to share to discuss shared experiences and really to to take uh, the questions and concerns you had and to try to delve into them and, and then share them collectively with the with the larger number steve what are your final closing comments with with regard to to this last session that we're describing here i i don't want to and i know i've beaten this a little bit all day long this drum, but I, I had so many comments or so many conversations in the last couple of days. I want us to remember that the slide you put up that talked about safety first and then long-term viability and short-term viability. And I know that the short-term viability is to open it up and to try to make as much revenue as we can. And the temptation for that is really severe or, or really strong. But I also want to, us to remember as a community, we will harm each other if we don't stay safe. If there is an outbreak in a dental office, it will harm us all. And I want us all just to take a minute, just take a step back. I know I was as enthusiastic as all of you were, and I had to just take a step back, reread and refocus. Let's try to keep everybody safe, stay within the guidelines. And on a personal note, it's been a long 11 weeks for all of us. Um, I really enjoyed reaching out to the community. I, I was much more involved with this than I thought I would be at the beginning. Um, I've gotten to know so many of you and appreciate all of the, the interaction that we had. I wanna thank both of you, the two of you, I'm looking right at you, the two of you for, for all of your hard work. Um, 
and, and being a part of this. We've been together doing this for more than a year, but it seemed to take on a new significance in this pandemic. We weren't sure how we should reach out. We really didn't have a plan. We came here and it just sort of all fell together. So thank the two of you. Thank everybody who's helped us and been involved, all of our guests that came on to help us make sense of this craziness. I think in our lifetime, none of us will forget this period in 2020. This is not something hopefully we're gonna see again. And I'm really, uh, really happy that I had this opportunity to be with you all. Menor? Um, I can't believe how after so many weeks uh, being together, I don't know if I'll be on Tuesday and two, uh, uh, at two withdrawal and I'm hoping none of you will be because we're so happy that now, you know, we'll be able to move forward with optimism. So we're really excited to, to finish sort of on this note as now we open up. Uh, for me, it was, it, it's sort of surreal. I mean, from being on a, on a two week sabbatical with a ventilator to, uh, or the hospital part of which was a ventilator, to being here and here we are talking about optimism and moving forward and as much as we're talking about being cautious and looking out for everyone of course this is with optimism who would have thought that almost three months ago we'd be here talking about that so it is it is a happy moment it's a very cautious one a very careful one but it's a happy moment in this very historic time so really we we can't thank you enough for joining us um Steve, John, you guys were fantastic. Uh, so thank you for, for all your work. And, and we really cannot wait to see you in person versus virtually. So what John was saying, stay tuned. We'll be meeting in person. So uh, we just wish all of you sincerely only the best. Thanks again, Stephen Menor. It's, it's been such a treat to spend all this time with you in uh, some, some pretty crazy, crazy days and weeks that we've just gone through. Um, please look out for us. We will continue to hopefully have a presence in your professional lives, uh, virtually initially, and we're really looking forward to being able to uh, host you and house you um, where we can gather together. Continue to be well and stay safe. Thanks very much. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Take, take, take care, everyone. Bye-bye.